Greetings and welcome to the Alumni Relations Office partnership event with the Museum of Flight, a tour of military aircraft. My name is Mike Small and I'm Executive Director of the Alumni Relations Office at NJIT. And it's my pleasure to introduce our docents today, two great guys that I've gotten a chance to know pretty well over the last couple months, Bill McCutcheon, a docent and member of the Board of Trustees at the Museum of Flight, who's been working with the museum for over 23 years, and John Fehrenbach, who's a docent and the director and trainer for all docents coming in, and he's been with the museum for over six years. Gentlemen, thanks so much for uh, pulling this together for us tonight. Our pleasure. You bet. Happy to be here. All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started with the tour. Uh, as a reminder to all of our viewers tonight, uh, just remember this is a live event. Occasionally technical glitches will occur. We don't expect it, but we anticipate being able to deal with it pretty quickly. So please bear with us if anything comes up. In the meantime, I do want to remind everyone as well, please feel free to ask your questions in the uh, comments field on social media, uh, and this will be available as a recording afterwards. All right, gentlemen, without further ado, let's uh, go ahead and get started with our tour. Thank you, Mike. Uh, good afternoon. Good evening, everybody. Uh, it's a real pleasure for us to be joining you this afternoon, this evening on the, on the East Coast. Thank you so much for inviting the Museum of Light to join you for this virtual tour of some of our unique historic artifacts. As Mike said, my name is John Fernbach, and I've been a volunteer docent here at the museum for six years. Uh, before coming to the museum, I worked as a, as a structures engineer at the Boeing Company for 35 years, uh, working on a variety of military and commercial programs. I was a civil engineer by schooling out of Marquette University and uh, an aerospace engineer by virtue of 35 years at, at Boeing. I'm joined today by Becca Harmson, who is driving the virtual tour bus today and works as a volunteer services specialist in the museum's volunteer department and Bill McCutcheon and you'll get a chance to talk to Bill in just a little while another longtime volunteer docent. This is one of our first cross-country ventures for our virtual tours program. We have learned so much about virtual learning platforms in the past year. Despite the pandemic the museum continues to accomplish remarkable engagement with K through 12 students through their virtual education programs. And as the education department has learned new platforms and technologies, the docent program and the virtual tours program have been learning as well. So we're very excited to be able to bring you this program from three time zones away. We hope it is just the first of many such visits. Our tours today will give you an inside look at three very notable aircraft that are on display here in Seattle in our new aviation pavilion, a three and a half acre building where our largest aircraft are displayed undercover and out of our soggy Northwest weather. These aircraft are the Boeing CH-47D, the Chinook helicopter, the venerable World War II era B-29 Super Fortress bomber, and the VC-137B SAM 970, better known as Air Force One, the first jet-powered Air Force One plane. Before we begin our tours, I'd like to spend just a few minutes introducing you to the Museum of Flight here in Seattle. The heart and soul of our museum campus, which is just six miles south of downtown Seattle, is the historic Boeing Red Barn. We are not a Boeing museum. We are an independent nonprofit foundation, but the Boeing company and the Boeing family have been great friends of the museum since its inception. And we have a great deal of Boeing blue DNA in our heritage, starting with the Red Barn. The Red Barn was built as a shipyard in 1909 and acquired by William Boeing in 1910. It became the first manufacturing building and the headquarters of the Boeing Company in 1917, one year after the company was founded. It was the center of Boeing's original Plant One and continued to serve in various manufacturing capacities until the historic Plant Two came online in 1936. I think you'll find me saying historic about a lot of things today, but uh, but we're proud of that proud of that heritage. By the 1970s, it had fallen into disrepair and was scheduled for demolition. At that time, it was acquired by William Boeing Jr., the son of the founder, 
donated to the museum and uh, barged to its current site in 1975. After a comprehensive renovation, it opened in 1983 as the first gallery and the largest artifact of the Museum of Flight. It was followed soon after by the amazing Great Gallery with its glass walls and ceiling, which opened in 1987 and is the home of our golden age of flying collection, as well as uh, rotating uh, exhibits and some touring exhibits. The Great Gallery spans aviation history from the Wright Flyer through the Vietnam Air War. In 2004, we opened the Personal Courage Wing where our World War I and World War II collections are displayed, along with telling the courageous stories of the men and women who flew and supported the war efforts. In 2011, we added the Charles Simone Space Gallery. The, the building was built in the hope of housing one of the retiring NASA space shuttle vehicles. Unfortunately, we did not receive one of the flying shuttles, but instead, as a consolation prize of sorts, uh, NASA gave us their shuttle full fuselage trainer visible there through the front wall of the Simone Gallery. It is an exceptional artifact for our museum whose vision statement is to be the foremost educational aerospace <laughs> museum in the world. You can walk in the cargo bay and get tours inside the crew compartment, which you certainly cannot do in any of the flying shuttles. In 2016, on the 100th anniversary of the Boeing Company, we opened the Aviation Pavilion, which allowed us to bring most of our large airplane collection in out of the weather under its three and a half acre roof. Now you'll notice it doesn't have walls yet. So if any of you alumni have a couple of million dollars burning a hole in your pockets, um, please give us a call. I'm sure the museum would be willing to put your name on the building uh, in return for uh, some seed funding for, for walls. And, and finally, in 2019, we opened the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Park, which is the final resting place for our restored B-52G. It is a city park maintained by the museum, and it serves as a quiet, peaceful tribute to all veterans, and in particular, our veterans of the Vietnam War era. A former president of the, uh, and, and CEO of the Museum of Flight used to tell the story about uh, visiting back in Washington, D.C. At a, at a conference of museum uh, executives, and he bumped into the director of the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum, and the, the Smithsonian director asked if, uh, if he minded when the Museum of Flight was referred to as the Smithsonian of the West, and our, our director said, uh, no, not at all. We are flattered by that association, and we really value our, our relationship with the Museum of, with the uh, Smithsonian. And, uh, and the Smithsonian director replied, the reason I ask is because yesterday I was talking to a visitor here at the, at the Smithsonian, and they referred to our museum as the Museum of Flight of the East. With that, we'll begin our first tour, the venerable Boeing CH-47D Chinook. The CH-47 Chinook was designed in the late 1950s in response to a U.S. Army uh, r for p a request for proposal for a highly mobile and versatile transport for troops, equipment, and weapons. The twin rotor concept was invented by Frank Piasecki of the helicopter company of the same name, which eventually became Boeing Vertol after a couple of name changes uh, in 1960. The original design concept was deemed to be too heavy for an attack helicopter and too light for a transport mission, at least for the transport mission that they had, they had specified. It eventually became the CH-46 Sea Knight, which has been used by the Marines since 1962. Instead, the Army ordered a larger version, which would become the CH-47 Chinook. The pre-production model first flew in 1961, the production version was named the CH-47, first delivered in 1962 and deployed to Vietnam by 1965. It typically carries a crew of four, the pilot, the commander, flight engineer, and the crew chief or loadmaster. 
The Chinook has been in continuous production for over 50 years. It's Boeing's longest uh, continuous production program. Over 1,200 have been delivered and production under current contracts is expected to run through 2025. Our aircraft is a CH-47D. It first entered service in 1963 as a CH-47A, only the fifth Chinook off the uh, production line accepted by the US, US Army. In the early 1980s, it was upgraded to the CH-47D uh, configuration, which featured more powerful or better everything, engines, transmissions, rotor blades, electrical and hydraulic systems, uh, radios, and navigation equipment. The cargo hook system was upgraded from a single hook system to a three hook system that was rated up to 26,000 pounds. Here we get a, cr a quick look at the Chinook and its massive rotors. The Chinook fuselage is 52 feet long, but the massive 60 foot rotors measure 98 feet from the forwardmost point to the aftmost point. The rotors are counter rotating, so the torque effects of each rotor are balanced by the other. And that allows all of the available horsepower to be utilized for lift instead of losing nearly a third of the uh, horsepower to counter torque, which is fairly typical number for a single rotor um, uh, helicopter. There are five gearboxes shown in red, which transfer the power from the twin Lycoming engines to the central uh, drive shaft. And then off of the drive shaft, another gearbox uh, powers each of the uh, uh, the rotor shafts. In the event of an engine failure, the transmission keeps both rotors moving and the Chinook will continue to fly and be stable. Now, helicopter flight is a fascinating study in vector mechanics, and we're in a dangerous place here. I'm an engineer talking to a, a bunch of engineering alumni, uh, so we could get stuck here for a, a long time, but uh, I will try to avoid that. Each rotor head is fully articulated, meaning that each rotor blade does not simply spin whipped around the central axis, but it has multiple mechanisms that change the attitude of each blade in flight. The blades change pitch continuously and independently as they rotate to increase lift and thrust and minimize drag. Because of the constant changes in lift and thrust, each blade experiences flap and droop lead and leg. So the blades are moving constantly uh, while they're rotating with horizontal and vertical hinges at the rotor hub to reduce the stresses in the blade. Here's a, a cutaway view of the Chinook. And before I show you the planned stops on our, on our tour inside the craft, I just want to point out a couple things that we won't necessarily see in our aircraft. Uh, first, you get a good look at the landing gear here. Uh, twin tires on two sets of gear at the uh, close to the center line of the uh, of the helicopter, a little bit forward, and then there are two sets of gear in the back, but they're a single tire, and one tire is the steering tire, and one is just a caster. Um, the uh, the gear can be mounted with snow skids for landing on snow and ice. And then uh, beneath the uh, bottom of the helicopter, you see the three mounts that were uh, uh, upgraded on the D model. Uh, we'll get a look at that center mount in a little bit once we're inside the, uh, the uh, looking out the bottom hatch of the cargo bay. So here's the path that we'll take on our tour. We'll drop in at the nose of the Chinook, then we'll wander back to take a quick look at the engines. We'll come back forward and look at the nose art before we uh, step through the forward door. Once inside, we'll look at the cargo bay, head to the back to look at the loading ramp area, then turn around to dis discuss sling loading before we finish up in the cockpit. Let's jump in. So here's our first look at our most recent major aircraft acquisition, the CH-47D Chinook helicopter. 
I've already given you the, the history of the model and of our aircraft. So I won't go over that again, but let me add one point. When our Chinook was retired by the Army in 2017, it was the oldest flyable Chinook in their fleet. This historic helicopter will be displayed in perpetuity in this patina, in functional working order, but clearly well used and well worn in its service to the US Army. No additional restoration is planned at this time. Let's wander to the back and get a look at the engines and the rotor hub. So the heart of this remarkable aircraft is its engine and the transmission system of five gearboxes that transmit power to the two enormous 60-foot carbon fiber rotors. With the D upgrade, the engines were rated at more than twice the horsepower of the original Lycoming power plants, and thus the lift capacity was increased from around 10,000 pounds for the A models to a maximum rating today of 26,000 pounds. Each engine is fitted with a conical FOD screen for an object debris to prevent dirt, dust, and other potential contaminants from entering the engine uh, while, uh, while the helicopter is in use. Because of the combining main gearbox that we talked about earlier, the CH-47 remains stable and is capable of flying with one engine out. The articulated hubs, which I described a little earlier, are covered on our aircraft, uh, covered from the elements with a jacket that uh, is part of the original Army issue maintenance equipment that came with the aircraft. The jacket protects the rotor hub mechanism from the elements while the craft is in storage. Let's move forward back to the, to the main cabin door. As we move back up towards the front of the Chinook, we'll pause at the, here at the main door uh, to talk about the nose art on our aircraft, my old lady. To our knowledge, our Chinook is the only helicopter in the US Army fleet that carries authorized nose art. During the Vietnam War era, nose art on the Chinook fleet was fairly common, but gradually the Army did away with that practice. And upon its retirement, the nose art on my old lady was the only authorized nose art in the US Army inventory. The Chinooks were not designed to be offensive gunships. Three 60 millimeter uh, M60 machine guns could be mounted in the cabin, one at the forward door, one at the uh, opposite the forward door at the, uh, at the portal that you see, and one at the loading ramp in the back of the cabin with stops in the gun mounting to prevent shooting off your own rotors. In the original design, the Chinooks carried no armor. Later versions carried additional armor plate under the pilot seats and around critical flight control hydraulics. In the late 1960s, four CH-47As uh, were converted into a more heavily armed <coughs> attack version, and they performed well in limited usage. But uh, the maintenance costs were high, and the powers that be recognized that the Chinook was much more valuable and useful in its primary mission as a transport vehicle, so no other gunship conversions were made. As we step through the forward hatch of the Chinook, we get a, a, a good look at the wide open uh, interior space of the helicopter, which maximizes its mission flexibility. In its cargo bay, the Chinook is capable of carrying a load of 33 to 55 fully equipped troops. Alternatively, it could carry 24 loaded stretchers with three attendants or up to a 24,000 pound uh, equipment payload. The Chinook typically had a crew of four, the pilot and commander in the cockpit. There was no co-pilot. The commander was usually the senior officer of the two pilots. The flight engineer stationed at the forward door and the crew chief stationed at the back of the cabin. The record load of personnel was reportedly 163 civilians on board during a village relocation mission in Vietnam. Such village relocations might also have included livestock and pets as well as the villagers. So the interior was very noisy, but 
not so much due to the people and the livestock as to the five hardworking transmissions that were spinning overhead just behind a, a thin sheet metal uh, barrier. Let's move to the back of the cabin. From this stop, we'll first look to the rear of the Chinook. The back end of the helicopter comprises a large ramp that opened to the tarmac to allow equipment to be loaded uh, by forklift or driven directly into the interior of the cabin. The Chinook could also land on water, uh, in which case it would be equipped with a water dam at the base of the, of the ramp. The typical internal payload may have included vehicles and artillery. A Chinook could accommodate two Humvees or a Humvee and a large artillery piece but more often the cargo bay was filled with supplies, including mail for the troops. The fleet of Chinooks carried the call sign freight train as the helicopter was indeed the semi-truck of army operations, rarely carrying troops, but most often carrying supplies, beans and bullets. Chinooks arriving at camp were always a welcome sight because the troops knew that they were being resupplied. And in particular, they were bringing the latest mail from home. The aft ramp could be closed completely in flight as you see it here, but often would be flown with the ramp fixed in a horizontal position, or at least with that upper tongue, that uh, gray sheet metal piece uh, opened uh, for ventilation and cooling. And you see all of the, uh, the exposed hydraulics and electrical systems. Uh, this is an area where some of the uh, armor plate was, was added in, in uh, later versions, but otherwise a very functional interior. As we turn to look forward into the cabin, we get the proper perspective to talk about the other primary transport mission of the Chinook, the external or sling loading. Initially, the Chinook was equipped with a single external hook, and that's the piece that you're looking through, looking at through the uh, open hatch on the floor. Uh, it also carried an internal uh, winch and uh, pulley system. So the, the pulley would have been directly above the opening here in the ceiling of the, of the cabin. The, uh, the winch would have been forward by the, uh, by the forward door. And that was used for, for uh, lifting um, personnel primarily all the way up through the hatch into the interior of the cabin. At the D upgrade, the uh, two additional hooks were added forward and aft of the of this center hook and that three hook system could be used to carry multiple loads or it could simply be used to balance and stabilize a, a heavier load on the on the center hook. The loading operations were directed by the loadmaster from inside the cabin. His working post was typically flat on his belly at the aft edge of the floor hatch right in front of you. From there, he could view the loading operations clearly and he would be providing radio instructions to the pilot for positioning the hook or the load. 20 forward, 10 down, 10 more forward, five right would be typical of the type of instructions radioed to the pilot as the loadmaster positioned the Chinook so that the ground crew could attach or release the load. Uh, external loading made for a very fast turnaround, releasing a load quickly and moving over to a loading site to attach the next payload. Internal loading would, would uh, uh, increase the term, turnaround time significantly as the helicopter had to land and lower the ramp in order to unload and reload. The Chinooks did not land in camp. Usually the landing and loading area was outside the wire, outside the protected perimeter, because the rotor wash was so powerful that it would totally disrupt routine camp operations. One of the most important missions of the uh, Chinook freight trains was the recovery of downed or disabled aircraft at the battlefronts. During the Vietnam War, it is estimated that the CH-47 fleet recovered nearly 12,000 disabled aircraft valued at well over $3 billion. 
at the Museum of Flight, we have docents who have been pilots and crew chiefs during their army service, as well as uh, loadmasters down on the ground. So we get to hear some true to life stories from their years of service. One of the, uh, the stories I enjoy telling is about the, uh, uh, the crew member who forgot to statically discharge the aircraft. So, so the helicopter rotors generate a great deal of static electricity and, uh, and the ground crews were instructed, they had a, a, a pole with a, with a tether at the end to discharge the static accumulation on the aircraft. And uh, one of the grounds crew forgot to do that and he was up on top of a pallet reaching for the, the hook. Our, uh, our docent uh, uh, crew chief saw the, uh, the static, the blue flash as the static discharged to this crew member and he was blown sideways off of the load and another crew member uh, stepped up to take his place. When the Chinook returned uh, an hour or so later for the next load, the uh, the original crew member was back, but he was uh, he was uh, wrapped in gauze around his uh, his head, and that was probably a, a lesson he uh, he didn't need to learn twice. Okay, let's uh, let's move back to the to the front of the aircraft, and we'll poke our heads into the. CH-47D cockpit. The D models were the last with this style of, of cockpit. The F version upgraded the cockpit instrumentation with glass screens and advanced avionics. The pilot was seated on the left, the commander on the right, again, the more senior officer. There was room for an observer in the cockpit, but the flight engineer and crew chief were stationed in the rear cabin, as I pointed out earlier. The flight engineer was the commander's right-hand man. He knew the most about this helicopter, the, the repair record, the idiosyncrasies of this helicopter's operations and systems. In the center bank of the instrument panel are the engine and transmission gauges and the master warning panel, that panel of rectangular lights. In front of each pilot are turn and bank indicators, artificial horizon and vertical airspeed indicators. Now, I'm not a pilot, nor did I ever play one on TV, but I'll try to give you a simple idea of the flight controls that the Chinook pilot uses. At the floor are the rudder pedals, which operate much like the rudder pedals of a fixed wing aircraft. You push left and the nose goes left, you push right and the nose goes right. In addition, there's a stick, which the pilot uses to control pitch, stick forward or stick aft, and roll, stick left or stick right. Finally, the handle at the left side of each seat is the collective, which controls the pitch of the rotor blades and thereby causes the helicopter to climb or to drop. In the hover mode, all four of the pilot's extremities, both hands and both feet, are working at the same time. The pilot's manual controls are augmented by the Stability Augmentation System, SAS. And this is not an autopilot, but it's an it's a add-on system that is, uh, provides short-term attitude adjustments due to uh, external influences, primarily wind gusts, while the pilot continues doing the hands-on flying. This completes our virtual tour of the Chinook CH-47D helicopter. Let's hop back outside, take a final look at the exterior of the aircraft. So the Chinook family of helicopters has been in continuous production and service for well over 50 years. Production is expected to continue to at least 2025 and with modernization contracts in place, the, uh, the plane is expected to be in service or the helicopter is expected to be in service until the 2030s. The, Chinook may have entered our, our collective national consciousness in news clips and films from the Vietnam War era, but it has continued to carry out its highly effective transport and supply mission for additional generations of service. Other missions include medevac, uh, aircraft recovery, firefighting, parachute drops, uh, heavy construction, civil construction, disaster relief, and search and rescue. And in fact, in the U.S. Army Air National Guard and among our international customers, 
Chinooks often spend most of their flight hours on those other types of missions. We're really proud to have this uh, historic aircraft in our collection at the Museum of Flight. Uh, we might be able to take a couple questions at this time, otherwise we can hold them uh, until the end uh, of the session. Yeah, and gentlemen, and, I think we'll, uh, we'll keep going with the tour on this one. I do see some questions coming in, but we can hold some of those to the end. Very good. With that, I'll pass it over to my distinguished fellow docent, Bill McCutcheon. Thank you, John. Very well done. Always enjoy that. Well, thank you all again for joining us. Uh, as I said, they said, my name is Bill McCutcheon. I, unlike John, I am not an engineer. I served my career as a CPA and business consultant, graduated from the University of Washington. And before that, I served uh, in the Navy on two aircraft carriers and flew on a uh, anti-submarine patrol aircraft. I am a private pilot do not fly anymore, but uh, certainly enjoyed that and uh, thoroughly enjoy my time at the museum. It's a wonderful place to be. So why don't we jump into our next artifact, the B-29. And we're going back in history, obviously, uh, from the more current CH-47. But this is an aircraft that I have always loved, and uh, I'll tell you some things about it here. When the Air Corps was ready for a new long-range bomber, and this was back in the late 1930s, Boeing was ready. It had already been designing a long-range bomber, and it had a lot of experience building bombers and a flying boat and the first pressurized airliner all of which gave Boeing the advantage over its competitors. As a result, the Army Air Corps selected Boeing to build the B-29 as its primary contractor. Now this aircraft, it's, it's not an understatement, but this was the most technologically advanced bomber of World War II. And that is a fact. This airplane came along and just literally blew the technology out of the water. It was also the most expensive weapons project of World War II at a cost of about $3 billion, which, by the way, exceeded the cost of the Manhattan Project by around a $1 billion. So it was a very expensive project, but well worthwhile, as you see, as we're going to go on here. Now, the attack on Pearl Harbor back in August, December 7, 1941, made the B-29 a much more urgent need for the Army Air Force. At that time, they had become the Army Air Force. And this created some problems because the B-29 was rushed into production before all the flight testing had been completed. And that caused some issues with training of personnel, training of flight crew, maintenance people. It also created problems with production, production and delivery delays. And then the right engines, the new right engines were also another problem. They had a tendency to overheat and it took quite a while to work the, uh, the bugs out of this one. There were a lot of changes being made and the aircraft was, changes were being made even as it went into to operation. So uh, it, was, uh, it was a great airplane, but it got a rocky start. Well, some of the technological changes that I talked about the aircraft was much faster than the other bombers. It flew at about a 357 miles an hour top speed. It had a much longer range. Well, on an average bomb load, about a 3,300 mile range. And it also could carry a larger bomb load. It could carry up to 20,000 pounds of bombs, which was more than double what the existing B-17s and B-24s could carry. Now the engines, again, were new. Wright had just developed these new engines, 18-cylinder uh, engine, radial engine, air-cooled. But they had some serious problems with overheating, as I mentioned, and they even caused some fires that, that uh, proved to be, in one case, fatal. 
They also came up with another innovation. The aircraft was pressurized. Now, I mentioned they had, Boeing had developed the first pressurized airliner. They used this technology to carry over to the B-29. There were three separate crew compartments that were pressurized. The wing was also a new development. Boeing actually developed this wing. It's called the high aspect ratio Boeing 117 wing. And it was a very thin, very efficient wing. And they also added about another 20% of the wing was flaps. It needed these flaps, which were designed after the ones built by uh, Fowler back in 1924 because this aircraft needed to land at a slower speed. It was a very fast aircraft, but it needed to land at a slower speed. And the only way it could do that was to have these enormous flaps, and it was very successful. Also, they went to a tricycle landing gear as opposed to a tailwheel, which is what the B-17 was. And they had double wheels on all the wheels uh, to support the heavy weight of this aircraft. The maximum takeoff weight of this aircraft was designed for about 130,000 pounds. In actuality, with the heavy bomb loads they carried and the ammunition, they were, they were actually pushing 140,000 pounds on this. It also had another very unique technological advancement, the centralized automated con fire control system. The, the gun turrets were, were computerized. Now, this was back in 19... Actually, 1938 is when they started designing this aircraft, but they were flying this aircraft in 1944. And you think about the technology. I mean, computers, nobody even knew what a computer was, right? But they had designed this system. It was actually designed by General Electric, and it had some initial problems, but they worked out the problems, and it became very effective and very accurate. Also, B-29 was the first aircraft to use radar. And we'll take a look at some of these uh, features on the, the aircraft a little bit later. Looking at the airplane physically, it looks very sleek, doesn't it? Well, it needed to be. And it had a tubular fuselage, again, to aid in the pressurization and make sure the pressure stayed within the aircraft. And the cockpit was very unique because it did not have a step down cockpit like most aircraft. This is called a step less air, uh, cockpit where it became an integral part of the fuselage. And it's rather a nice looking aircraft because of that. It had uh, also went from one bomb bay to two bomb bays. Each one was 12 feet long and it had five automated gun turrets. Well, let's take a look at the, B the museum's B-29. This is before it was restored. This is back at Lowry Air Force Base in Colorado. And it looks pretty sad there, but they worked on it. They did some, a partial restoration on it. But when Lowry Air Force Base was, the operation was closed, the uh, Air Force uh, loaned the, the aircraft to the Museum of Flight. So we got it in, I believe it was 1993, and we continued the restoration project on this aircraft, and that covered about 25 more years. Let's take a look at the aircraft after it's restored. Isn't that a beauty? We're very proud of this aircraft. It was not restored to flyable condition. Initially, they were intending to, to restore it to flyable condition. But that uh, was put aside. It was 25 year restoration, as I said, during World War II, our aircraft flew with the 11th Bomb Wing, completed 37 combat missions, and it actually flew in Korea in a air refueling uh, role. It was called T Square 54. And this is a T Square 54 on a bombing mission during World War II. Well, let's go inside this aircraft. Oh, on second thought, we're going to look at the outside before we go inside. Thank you. This is the forward upper turret, the dorsal turret. And as you can see, they've added a couple of machine guns on this one. And the intent was to try to ward off head-on attacks. And it was very effective 
because of that. We also had a lower turret that had two 50 caliber machine guns in it. And then we go to the mid middle of the aircraft, and you'll see we've got a side gunner blister. On top, we've got the central fire control gunner dome. He was the one that controlled who took possession of the firing mechanism. You could actually have anybody on the aircraft, any of the gunners, firing two of the turrets. So it depended on the central fire controller's observation as well as the others. It was a very well synchronized procedure, but I guess it was very effective as well. You see the upper rear turret uh, just behind the dome. I want you to look at the size of the side gunner's blister compared to the uh, fire control gunner's dome. I want to tell you a little story when we get inside the aircraft. Now let's take a look at the two remaining turrets. You've got the lower rear turret, again, 250 caliber machine guns, and then the tail turret, which also has 250 caliber machine guns. Originally, they had a 20 millimeter cannon in there, but they decided to remove that. And uh, now we'll take a look inside the aircraft. Oops, I'm sorry, the radar. I keep forgetting the radar. That's the radome. And the radar was uh, used for target identification. It was also used for navigation. It was used for weather conditions. And it was also used for, for aircraft avoidance, uh, collision avoidance. So it had a number of uses and it was uh, proved to be very, very effective. Now we're gonna go inside the aircraft. I'll show you the route of our tour. We're gonna to start in the cockpit. We'll show you the flight engineer and navigator stations. Look at the tunnel and bomb bay. We're actually gonna go through the tunnel. And then the fire control and side gunners and then the radar operator winding up back in the tail with the tail gunner position. This shows the route of flight on the cutaway. You can see that tunnel right in the middle. We'll talk a little bit about that in just a minute. Okay, we're going to work our way up to the cockpit. This cockpit actually, by, by the standards of the day, was fairly roomy. If you compare that to the B-17 cockpit and the B-24 cockpit, there's quite a bit more room in this uh, cockpit because of the way it was laid out. Going forward, we're going to look at what uh, is known as the Norden bomb site. That was a, uh, developed in the 1930s by Carl Norden. It was actually designed for the Navy initially, but it was a very efficient computerized bomb site, very accurate, and it was also top secret. They didn't want anybody knowing about this, uh, air, this bomb site. So when the bombardier brought the bomb site, to the aircraft and took it from the aircraft to put it in storage, he was escorted by two armed guards. So top secret was the, was the, uh, the way it was identified. However, it was learned later on that an employee of the Norden company, who was a naturalized citizen of German ancestry, was actually working for the Nazis. And he had managed to smuggle out plans for the Norden bomb site. And of course, the members of the Luftwaffe were very impressed with that. They wanted to study these. The long and short of it is they looked at these plans, they compared it to their own bomb site, and they discarded the Norden bomb site idea. They decided it was too complex. Their bomb site was much more uh, easy to use. And they felt gave them the, the appropriate accuracy. So they, they didn't need it. However, through the rest of the war, the Army Air Force treated this as top secret. Now off to the right of the bomb site, you're gonna see one of the automated computerized gun sites. This is the bombardiers. He controlled the two forward turrets. And as we go through the aircraft, we'll find the other 
uh, bomb sites that were used. Again, this is a very accurate uh, uh, gun site and uh, proved extremely effective in, in uh, defense against attacking aircraft. Well, let's take a look through the rest of the cockpit. This is a good view of the pilot, and, the, and you're looking at the pilot on the right side and the co-pilot on the left side in this view. But you can see it's fairly spacious, and uh, they uh, had a good, good visibility outside of the aircraft as well. Moving back, we're going to find the other crew members. First crew member on the left-hand side over here is the flight engineer. Now, flight engineers felt they were probably the most important and busiest crew member on this aircraft because they had complete control over the engines. And if the engines weren't running or running properly, you had problems. Now, as I mentioned, the right engines did cause some initial problems. And one of the problems was, again, overheating. So the flight engineer was very concerned about keeping those engines cool. Now on the outside of the engine, behind the engine on the cowling, there's what are called cow flaps, which open and close and allow air to flow in through the front of the cowling, over the engine and out through the cow flaps, which again is a very, very good cooling feature. The only problem is when you have your cow flaps open, it's the equivalent of losing one engine. So pilots were not real excited about that, especially when they're taken off at a gross weight of 140,000 pounds, heavily loaded, and they need all the power they can get out of those engines. And the flight engineer is saying, I want those cow flaps open because I don't want an overheating engine. Anyway, there's this conflict that went on continuously, uh, but they managed, they managed to uh, resolve it. But that's a pretty complicated uh, set of controls there. And across from the flight engineer was a navigator station, obviously a very important position. You have to know where you're going to get to the target, correct, and get your, yourself back home. And then a little bit farther back on across from the navigator, you're going to find the radio operator. Again, communications, very important, only, not only internal but external. Now, as you're heading to the aft part of the aircraft, I want to show you the door on the right-hand side. That is a pressure door. What you're in right now is one of the three control pressure chambers. So when that door is closed, the forward section is pressurized. Also, there's a 34-inch diameter tunnel. You're looking at it on top there, and it's a 36-foot long tunnel. That is also pressurized, and what that allows the crew in the midsection and the front of the aircraft to travel back and forth between their compartments. The tail gunner on the other hand, his area is pressurized, but once they're up at altitude, he's pretty well stuck back in his area. He can't, can't get out of there. So we're gonna take a trip through this tunnel. I want you to be careful. I want you to hold your arms close in so you don't snag them on anything. We're gonna go through very fast, so hang on. Well, that's the Bombay. We're not going through the Bombay. We could, but we're not going to. We're going to go through that tunnel. It's a little tricky. Well, okay, we got back through the tunnel. I don't know how we did that, but we did it. And we're back at the uh, mid station uh, where all the three gunners are. You've got the, the central fire control gunner who sits in the seat in the middle and looks out that dome on top. And then you've got two side gunners, and each one of them has one of these computerized uh, gun sights. And the central fire control gunner who sits in the middle is the one that really makes the ultimate decision who gets control. He can just flick a switch and t give control to whoever he wants to. You can see the tunnel up there above that we came through. And uh, that was, uh, again, 34 inches, gives you plenty of room, apparently. Let me tell you a story, a true story, about a, one of the side gunners on one of the missions. This gunner had been on a mission, and on this mission, the upper uh, fire control uh, gunner's blister came loose. And we don't know if it was because of uh, damage from uh, uh, attacking aircraft or what caused it, but the gunner was 
literally sucked up to the the uh, dome and hit his head on the dome. Didn't he? Didn't other than that, he didn't have any problem. But he said, "You know what? I don't think I want that to happen again." So he started fabricating a special safety belt from parachute harnesses, and he he developed his own safety belt that was about five feet long. And he had a harness that he had made out of it, and he had got in the harness. He attached it to a safety rung on the, next to his seat. And he said, I'm just going to feel better. I'm just going to feel better. His other crew members kind of chuckled and thought, well, that's kind of ridiculous. You know, why are you doing that? Well, on one of the missions, they had gone on their bombing mission. They were returning, turning around, heading back for home, and they were attacked by uh, Japanese fighters. And the aircraft was hit several times. No serious damage, but, and they don't know if this was the cause of it or not, but the side gunner's window blew out. And they don't know, again, know if it was because of a, uh, a hit or what it was, but he was sucked out, of course, out of that window. It was big enough that a human body can go out that window. And he was out there literally hanging by his safety strap. And thank goodness he had made that because otherwise he would have been gone. Well, here we are at 31,000 feet. The pilot could not descend because he barely had enough fuel to get back home. And if he descended, he would get down where the engines would run much richer, use more fuel. And he said they just couldn't run the risk. So here this poor guy is out there hanging outside the window. Of course, there's not enough oxygen to breathe. His oxygen mask had blown off. And so he was uh, unconscious by this time. Well, the co-pilot came back and another crew member came back and they started pulling on his safety strap and eventually were able to grab his leg and pull him into the aircraft. Again, he was still unconscious. They gave him oxygen right away. And eventually he came to and survived. Well, guess what? Other crew members, not just on his airplane, but on other airplanes, started making their own safety belts. They thought maybe that wasn't such a bad idea after all. Okay, that's after that story, let's head back to the aft part of the aircraft. And there's the radar operator right there, just at the edge of that uh, pressurized compartment. And you see the pressurized door as you go aft. And we're going to go through there and uh, head back to the tail gun position. Seems like a long way. And you can see the pressure door on the tail gunner's position as well. Now we're back in the tail gun position. And you can see he had a pretty panoramic view. So he could pretty much see any attacking aircraft from the rear. Still, I don't think that'd be a place that I would want to be. Now he had, there's his, uh, his gun sight. And so he was pretty well focused on what was going on during the mission. Okay, we're gonna turn around and go back and we'll head outside through the bomb bay. Takes a little while to get out, doesn't it? That's the upper turret right there you're looking at. Now we're going out through the bomb bay. You can see the tunnel up above the bomb bay. The bomb bay could not be pressurized, obviously, because it opens and drops the bombs. And uh, it was necessary to have that pressurized tunnel as a result. As we're going forward, you can see the radar antenna. That's between the two bomb bays. And if you look, there you go, better closer view. All right. Okay, now we're gonna uh, leave the B-29. And we're gonna go over to Air Force One. Air Force One, 
this is the first jet Air Force One that served the President of the United States. Now, if you look on the uh, top of the fuselage there, you're going to see an array of antenna. And those are to serve all the electronic equipment. They had a number of communications and other electronic equipment in the aircraft. And as well as to protect the dignitaries that would fly, the president and others who flew on this aircraft, you had what was called electronic countermeasures. And there was a pod on each of the engine mounts, four engine mounts. And what these were designed to do was to interfere with the signal if a missile would, were to be fired at the aircraft. Now, they never had to utilize these, fortunately, but they were there if they needed them. Well, how do we come up with the term Air Force One? Well, it was in 1953, President Eisenhower was flying on his constellation, and they were in the airspace where another Eastern Airlines aircraft was flying, and it had the same call sign as the president's airplane. The Secret Service decided that maybe that wasn't such a good idea, that we needed to have a unique call sign so there would be no confusion whatsoever. So that's when they decided that we're going to use Air Force One. Now, any, any aircraft that the president is flying aboard is Air Force One. It could be a Cessna 172, for example, but it's Air Force One. Now, in 1959, the president upgraded and modified a, an existing uh, Boeing 707-120 to suit the needs of a presidential aircraft. And the exterior colors and interior of the aircraft were designed by Raymond Lowry, who was a noted industrial designist, along with uh, President Kennedy and uh, Jackie Kennedy. They, they modified it as well. Now, some of the dignitaries that flew on this aircraft were Presidents Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, and even Nikita Khrushchev, the Russian premier, flew on this. Uh, he made a trip to the United States and flew across the country and actually went to Disneyland. There was some controversy about allowing a Russian premier to use uh, the presidential jet. And of course, Henry Kissinger, Secretary of State, at that time uh, flew on this aircraft a few times. Now in 1962, President Kennedy ordered the first, call it a purpose-built Air Force One, first jet, and it was also a Boeing 707, but it's the aircraft that uh, President Kennedy flew to Dallas in 1963. He was on a, a campaign tour for the Democratic Party. And as you all know, that's where Kennedy was assassinated. And then uh, this aircraft, this 26,000 aircraft, was the one that Johnson took the oath of office to become the new president at that time. SAM 26,000. SAM, by the way, stands for Special Air Mission. So if you hear SAM, that's what it means. But in 1972, Nixon flew Sam 26,000 to a very mo monumental trip to China to meet with Mao Zedong. And, but 970, Sam 970, by the way, the 970, if you look at the tail of the aircraft, it's the last three numbers of the aircraft's identification number, serial number. So Sam 970 did accompany uh, President Nixon on that flight, however. Well, let's go and take a look at the next event that happened in 1969. This is called Giant Step. Now, of course, you know what happened in July of 1969. These three gentlemen, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins, all made a little trip to the moon. And two of them landed on the moon, and it was a very, very momentous occasion. As you know, President Kennedy had, had specified that by the end of this decade, which was the end of the 60s, we're going to put a man on the moon and return him safely. And that was accomplished. Unfortunately, President Kennedy was not alive to see this uh, fulfilled. Anyway, the, the idea of the tour was it was a goodwill tour. It was to tell the, the entire country that 
this mission wasn't just for the United States. This was for all mankind. So it was truly a goodwill tour. Started in Houston, went across the, uh, the world, wound up in Washington, D.C., took 38 days. They covered 24 countries, and it had proved very, very effective. Okay, let's take a look at what we're going to be uh, doing with the rest of our tour. We're going to start out in the cockpit, work our way back through the aircraft and see some of the very unique places in this aircraft that were uh, configured for the president's use. And we'll see it on the aircraft itself. We're going to see a uh, visual of where you're going to go. And now let's go inside. Now, remember I was talking about the B-29 and how spacious that cockpit was. Let's go up and take a look at this one. Not so much here. Everybody's pretty well packed in, aren't they? You've got the pilot on the left and the co-pilot on the right. And then over on the left behind the pilot, you've got a jump seat, and that would be for a visiting pilot or somebody else who was a dignitary that maybe wanted to fly in the cockpit. On the right-hand side is your flight engineer station. You remember I talked about that on the B-29. You can see all the instrumentation that the flight engineer had to control. And then behind the, the flight engineer was the navigator, right behind the jump seat there. You can't see it real well, but that's where the navigator sat. So this was very tight borders for these people, and that's a lot of people to put into a very small area. We'll go back and look at the rest of the aircraft. Before we get too far, I want you to look down below. There's a, that's a safe. Now, every time the president traveled, and, and currently, he carried a briefcase with the nuclear codes. And what that meant was, in the event that there was to be a nuclear attack, the president was only the only one as commander in chief authorized to release any kind of a nuclear weapon with those codes. They were kept in that safe at all times during the flight. As we work our way back on the left-hand side, this is the communications area. And again, I've pointed out all those different antennas on top of the aircraft, and this is one of the reasons. A lot of electronics in this aircraft, a lot of need to communicate uh, both electronically and verbally. Well, this was the heart of that. As we work our way back, there's a galley just behind that, the forward galley, where all those fine dishes were prepared for the president and all of the dignitaries. And just behind that, you can see the seating. This is really first class seating for the very special dignitaries that were flying with the president at this time. As we travel back, we're gonna to go to the presidential stateroom be on the left-hand side, the first door. We'll pop in there and see what's going on. Well, we don't see anybody, but this is where the president would, would hang out when he wasn't in meetings. And you can see that hat hanging down below the shelf. That's uh, where Lyndon Johnson would hang his cowboy hat. And then just behind that, look on the door. President Johnson had two beagles. And so he said, I'm putting a doggy door in because when that door is closed, I want my dogs to be able to go in and out. And they were able to do that. And then behind that, of course, is the presidential restroom and other facilities there. And let's go back a little bit farther and we'll see where the president conducted business. This is the conference area. So he would line up all the people that he wanted to talk to in that uh, seating area opposite the table and the, the chair. One thing Lyndon Johnson installed in this aircraft was a motor on this table that allowed it to raise and lower. When he had people, he had a bit of an ego. 
when he had people in the room, he wanted to appear as if he were sitting higher than they were. So he would lower the table. And that gave them the impression that, that he was made sure he knew they knew he was in charge. President uh, Johnson also liked to fool around with the thermostat. And I guess it just drove the crew members crazy because he was continually raising and lowering the temperature to meet his needs. Well, you know what they did? They installed a fake thermostat and the real one was, was located elsewhere. So he was turning the heat up and down, but really wasn't. He just thought he was. Whether he ever actually knew about that, I don't know for sure. Okay, as we go out of the conference room area, we'll travel back again to the aircraft. Now you can see this aircraft still as a 707, didn't have this, the capacity and the size of the current 747s. So it was still fairly compact but well utilized. Off to the right, you can see is before we go through that doors where the president's secretary sat and did her typing and whatever else she had to do. You can see that the even though the equipment was state of the art at that time, it looks pretty antiquated now, doesn't it? We could continue traveling back through the aircraft and there's more seating area. And this is where I'm, I imagine that the press would sit, would sit, the people who were not as high on the list of the uh, dignitaries, and but they still had the opportunity to fly on Air Force One, which is pretty impressive. Some of these flights were pretty long. So if people wanted to take a nap or take a rest at some point in time, these bunks would pull down from the uh, ceiling and they could just take a short break. As we moved aft, we're going to just about done here. These are the aft galleys where they serve food as well. And then, of course, the restrooms in the back for the members uh, that were seated in this particular area. Well, that concludes our tour through the Air Force One and our tour of the aircraft at this particular time. We really appreciate you joining us today and we hope when you get to Seattle, you will come and visit the Museum of Flight. I think you'll find it's a very, very fun place to be and very informative. Thank you. Gentlemen, I wanna thank you both. Uh, and for Becca and all the other folks at the Museum of Flight who put this together. Uh, I'm happy to say we, we actually have quite a few questions that came in. Um, we're having a bit of an issue in the chat, but we've got a few by email. So uh, they were mostly in order and I kept track of them. If you wouldn't mind, uh, we'll start with some of the Chinook questions. Um, the first question that came in was, uh, is there a, a, a plan to keep the Chinook in active action? Uh, essentially, what's the life cycle or the replacement cycle for Chinooks? So is the uh, Chinook something that's currently, you know, still being used? I believe it is. It is, it is. Um, and, the production contracts, Boeing is still working on production contracts. It's been in continuous production for over 50 years. And right now they have contracts for production through 2025. And wow. then uh, in addition, there are uh, modernization contracts within the, the uh, U.S. Army. So they will be upgrading the, the fleet that they have. Um, so, for example, early on, you know, the, the first versions that were introduced were A's. Uh, in the 1960s, in the early 1980s, uh, about 400 of the A's were upgraded to the D's, and that's how our our A became our D. And uh, in fact, ours was the first Army Chinook that was upgraded to the to the D. So it is indeed a, a historic aircraft. So even today, there are similar modernization programs going on. And that's expected to keep the Chinook in service uh, well into the 2030s. Uh, it's not quite as long as the, the B-52 track record, but it's a it's a pretty significant uh, track record of, of its own. I mean, and, that's an incredible piece of engineering to keep <laughs> in active duty for that long. Yeah, you know, and, and as I mentioned, I'm not a pilot. I had really no comprehension of, of helicopter operations. I've learned a lot about this aircraft. Uh, in the past couple of months. Um, but by all reports, 
that you know the the twin engines and the five transmissions that kept the rotors going very reliable um very few reported uh, uh failures certainly not a, any kind of a chronic uh maintenance issue with the transmissions or the engines and even in the event of an engine out that transmission system was designed to keep both rotors going uh so you still had stable flight just had less lift capacity well, and one of the questions that came in right after that was, how does the Chinook handle issues with rotor vibration, uh, given the fact that there's two? So, um, yeah, I'm kind of curious about that myself, given the size and the scale of those rotors. How does it manage that? So, so they're the same size. Uh, you know, it's not that one is larger, one is smaller. They are the same size rotors. Uh, they, are, they are synchronized, of course, in terms of their rotation. And again, they, they counter-rotate. So the, the torque effects are, are immediately balanced one by the other. And, and the, uh, the blades are synchronized in such a way that, that as they pass over the center of the fuselage, they're not gonna, they're not gonna hit each other. Mm -hmm. um, and really to me, you know, again, I, I could get carried away as an engineer here, but the mechanisms in that rotor that change the, the pitch of the rotor blades independently, so it's one thing that you know the entire rotor uh, disc will will rotate and that'll give you uh, forward motion of the uh, helicopter or when the when the rotors go go to a more horizontal position then you've got basically a hover mode. But as the as the rotor uh, circles around the central shaft, the the forward one blade is going forward and then as it it passes the center line of the aircraft, then it's going aft. So the lift characteristics change going forward and aft. And and all those mechanisms are controlled within the hub. There's a there's a vertical hinge, a vertical hinge, so so the blade can swing forward and aft uh, just a little bit. And there's a horizontal hinge, so the blades actually flap up and down. And then there's a there's a piston that changes the, the pitch of each uh, blade individually. And uh, on top of all that, there's the collective, which is a ring, which changes the pitch of all the blades at the same time. And that, that affects your overall lift of the helicopter or, or uh, lowering the, the altitude, elevation. Um, so it, to me, it's a, you know, I was a civil engineer by schooling. Um, parts aren't supposed to move when you're in civil engineering. You just, <laughs> you just, you bolt the hell out of everything. <laughs> and, and so in my in my career at Boeing, you know, learning about these advanced mechanisms is really one of the most fascinating things about that, about these advanced aircraft. Well, and that's going to lead into some of the other questions that come up. And of course, my interest as well, I've got to say. So the next question was on to the B-29 and it talks about uh, the question is, what was the average wear rate of the B-29? Um, obviously with all these aircraft and their different timelines and everything, but uh, there's got to be so much wear on these things. So I, I don't know if you know the average wear rate, um, but uh, <clears throat> it's got to pertain to all the different things going into the aircraft. When you say wear rate, I, 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 I immediately think of the engines because that was the most critical issue on the aircraft. And they changed those engines frequently because they, they had a number of issues and you got, you can think you've got 18 cylinders that are moving a lot of equipment. So they had a lot of issues with the engines. And so frequent engine changes, yes. Uh, spark plugs were another issue. Spark plugs would get fouled frequently. They were continually changing. I, 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 Champion must have had a real contract with them. I don't know who had the contract, but... <laughs> <laughs> they, Somebody they made changing. up pretty well. <laughs> yeah, they made up pretty well. But I think they got they got the overheating issues uh, pretty much resolved uh, by reconfiguring some of the baffling and and the oil cooling system because some of the upper cylinders were not getting properly cooled and they would overheat. They would swallow their valves. I mean, they had a number of issues. But so it took them a while to get those resolved. They didn't really get the engine issues fully resolved until when they went to the uh, the silver plate, the atom uh, bomb uh, carrying aircraft, where they put fuel injected engines on, which solved a lot of the problems because the carbureted engines just didn't, they, they were not able to, to 
completely solve the issues with the overheating and with the uh, the fuel distribution. So anyway, uh, as far as where, I mean, I don't know about the frequency, but I know that they did change engines frequently. The the structure itself was was strong enough. Uh, as you know, Boeing built and continues to build, I believe, very very strong over engineered aircraft. And so even with the pressurization, because the pressurization was contained within compartments. And if I, I, I don't have it available right this moment, but they had separate compartments that they would actually put inside the, uh, the fuselage itself that would contain the uh, air pressure. So, gentlemen, I'm going on and on. I better, I better shut up. No, here. no, that's that's. But look, this is this is what we're here for. Um, I want to be mindful of time, um, so I'm going to pick uh, three more questions. There's two for Air Force One. I'm going to do one more for B29. Uh, I will send you these questions afterwards. Love to see if you wouldn't mind responding to some of them. Um, sure. The B29 had uh, a question about why it didn't have a pilot throttle. Uh, why it was an engineer not a pilot <laughs> throttle. So, well, I, you know, it, curious good about question. That. Yeah, good question. The pilot, uh, the, the flight engineer was in control of the engines. and But he worked, you know, and that's why the flight engineer was, was positioned exactly where he was because the pilot was right there and could give instructions to the flight engineer what he wanted in power. So the pilot was controlling the engines, but directly it was a flight engineer. So the flight engineer was not just arbitrarily controlling those engines. During the flight, during cruise flight, the, the flight engineer would control the engines from the standpoint of fuel flow, uh, cylinder head temperature, uh, temperature overall of the air engine, make sure they're running smoothly, make sure they're running coolly uh, and, and efficiently. Does that answer the question? Uh, it does. And, you know, that, that sort of leads into... We did one more question of the B-29. Most of our questions were actually about the B-29, um, and then I'll, I'll round out with a question about Air Force One now. So uh, for the B-29, uh, what was the control system for the guns? How did it accommodate the pressurized system? I know you mentioned uh, that it was an automated system. Was this something that was mechanical in nature or computerized? Uh, you, you touched it, on it. but It, it was, was computerized. I'm, I'm going to pull out. i got a, kind of a cheat sheet here I want to refer to, if that's okay. Uh, that will help me a little bit. Uh, the 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 uh, the actual uh, the computers and as I said they were they were General Electric initially. The they had contracted with Sperry for these uh, uh, automated gun control systems. They had so many problems. They finally said we're going to go to GE, and GE had a much better handle on the uh, the systems. Just a side note. Uh, the uh, consolidated was one of the uh, bidders on the B-29 project. They were selected as a backup in the event that the Boeing B-29 <laughs> was not successful. How's that, huh? <laughs> uh, <laughs> they said, yeah, we, we believe in you. However, uh, well, anyway, so, so they got the contract for what was called the XB-32. Now, consolidated... It was pressurized as well. They had continual problems with their pressurization system and finally just couldn't resolve them. So they were, uh, they, they were, could only fly at, at lower levels. Also, they had serious problems with their uh, automated uh, gun control system because Sperry just couldn't get their issues resolved. So Boeing made the right decision to go with GE. Anyway, what would happen is the the uh, the computer w was able to determine the airspeed of the aircraft that was on attack. It would allow for the lead on the aircraft. You have to have you have to lead the aircraft, correct? And it also took into consideration such things as gravity, temperature, humidity. I mean, they had all these factors it was considering with respect to making the the aim point on this particular target. And it's incredible I, technology for the time, especially. It's it, phenomenal when you think about it. It really was. But it was extremely accurate. And the thing that I I still don't understand, and I, I have a, a, a friend who was a navigator on a B-29 that I stay in contact with, 
He's I think he's 97 years old, and he's sharp as a tack. And so I bounce questions off of him from time to time, and, and I just said, how did these gunners orchestrate all Absolutely. five of these turrets when they were being attacked at, you know, what, a closing speed of maybe 500 miles an hour? Yeah. <laughs> uh, he said, I don't know, but he said they did it, and they did it beautifully. <laughs> And I guess that's Sometimes training you just and practice. It on. You know, <laughs> I think you know. I think the uh, the development of that of the gun control system, the fire control system, is probably underrated compared to say the you know yes. the the literature that goes toward the Norden bomb site. You know, the Norden bomb site is a is pretty much a planar system. Yes. You know, the pilot would get it into a into a, a straight and level flight, and then turn yep. it over to the bombardier, whereas the uh, gun control system is is three dimensional system That's all right. the way. That's yeah. right. Yeah, and I've, I've got to imagine that it, it's got to be almost impossible. You couldn't do that manually. Well, and particularly in a pressurized system, right? Because the gun is exactly. actually moving around, so so it has to physically be separate because you're in the pressurized area and it's not exactly, right? exactly. That's it, exactly. And you think about this. I mean, again, look at the look at the time period we're talking about from 1938 to 1944 is when this was designed, tested, and flown. And to have developed a system this complex and this automated during that period of time is just remarkable. It's it was remarkable. 30 years, 40 years after the first plane oh, is absolutely. flying. You've got <laughs> All right, so again, I want to be mindful of time. Um, two quick questions, I'll, I'll do two, because uh, they're, they're pretty straightforward about Air Force One. One was, are, are there sleeping quarters or were there sleeping quarters for the president? Uh, and the second one was, uh, when did that particular Air Force uh, Air Force One ship retire? Okay, good questions. Uh, yes, there were sleeping accommodations for the president and that was in his stateroom. The, the long couch, and I meant to mention that, the long couch that you saw actually converted into a bed. Mm. So the president could, you know, take a nap or sleep uh, if he wanted to. And the other question was, uh, yeah, when when did they retire that oh, yeah. particular aircraft? Yeah, the uh, Air Force uh, Sam nine seventy was retired in nineteen ninety six, so it had a pretty long life when you yeah. consider it from nineteen fifty nine to nineteen ninety six. And during that period of time, of course, after in nineteen sixty two, when the uh, the new Sam twenty six thousand was inaugurated. Sam 970 was relegated to, you know, carrying lesser uh, dignitaries, but it did continue to carry dignitaries. And after its retirement in 1996, uh, it was uh, given to the museum on loan uh, from the National Museum of the United States Air Force. So we were really proud to receive that aircraft and uh, we're proud of it today. Wow. All right, gentlemen, thank you again so much for taking the time. It's been my pleasure to host you today for this tour. Uh, Bill McCutcheon, John Fahrenbach from the Museum of Flight, a fantastic job, and we look forward to doing more of these with you. Thank you. It's our pleasure. We look forward to it as well. You bet. Thanks, Mike. So again, this has been our most recent uh, Highlander alumni event for NJIT alumni, the virtual tour of military aircraft from the National Museum of Flight. My name is Mike Small and I'm Executive Director of the Alumni Relations Office. I want to remind everybody that you will be able to see this and many other video presentations on our website at njit.edu slash alumni, or you can visit our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash njit alumni. You can visit us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and a variety of other social media platforms. And do make sure to check these out as a podcast as well on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. So I look forward to seeing you again. And as I say at the conclusion of all of our video casts, go Highlanders. <laughs>